an original MCM production. Now, without further ado, Richie Burke, president of Go Get It, will introduce our program. Richie, there he is. He's coming from the back of the room. <laughs> we don't want to lose you. Off to a good start. <laughs> good afternoon. Today is a special day. Not only is my amazing grandmother in attendance, our fellow Rotarian, Ian Abstin, sitting front and center, has actually doubled his 2016 Rotary attendance by joining us for today's program. <laughs> Welcome back. I also get to introduce someone very close to me, my father, John Burke, who is the president at Trek Bicycle, he served on George W. Bush's Presidential Council of Physical Fitness. And just recently, as of this last weekend, he officially became the 2016 Burke Family Vacation Ping Pong Champion. <laughs> I took second. Somehow he managed to edge me out. It may have been an early Father's Day gift. <laughs> but the real reason why he's here today is because he recently came out with his second book, The 12 Simple Solutions to Save America, where he speaks candidly on what America's core values should be and offers 12 simple solutions to save the complex problems that our country faces today. It's a quick read for anyone who's interested. We do have copies in the back and we'll be taking cash or charge at the end. They're only $12 today. They're about 15 on Amazon. So John's going to come up and speak about the book for a few minutes, and then we have Dave Haynes here with us who will be interviewing John after he talks. Dave is the editorial page editor and a columnist at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and president of the Association of Opinion Journalists. He also serves on the board of the Wisconsin Freedom, Freedom of Information Council. At this time, I would like to call up John Burke and Dave Haynes. Thank you very much, Richie. I want to thank the Rotary for having me here today. Um, in the fifth grade, my mother took the family to Washington. And we visited Williamsburg, and we saw Jamestown in Virginia, and then we went to DC, and I saw the Capitol and the White House. And I was hooked on American history. And uh, when I was a kid, I would get off of school. I'd go home and raid the cookie jar. I would then go over to my friend's house, and if it was in the fall, I'd play football. In the winter, we'd play basketball. In the spring, we'd play baseball. And I'd always be home by 5.30 for Walter Cronkite in the CBS Evening News. Over the years, I've become increasingly frustrated with our political system here in the United States. I see major problems that never get addressed. I see constant bickering between Republicans and Democrats who are more interested in getting reelected than they are in serving their country. In 2011, Richie graduated from Marquette, and I was really looking forward to going to the graduation because David McCullough, the great American historian, was going to be the commencement speaker. And his final point of advice to the graduates, and he looked out over the graduates and in very strong words, he said, at some point, do something for your country. And that really stuck with me. And that night, uh, on the way back to Madison, I thought about what I could do for my country. And I had just finished writing a book about my dad. 
and I came to the conclusion on the way home that night, I could write a book about America. Um, I love business, I love solving problems, I love competing, and I see all these problems in America, and I thought what I could do is I could write a book, and my book would focus on big problems that nobody ever seems to address. And so I've done that, and the book's up on the screen here. It's 12 Simple Solutions to Save America. It's uh, all in 124 pages. Um, I was on a walk to see a friend this morning, and I ran into uh, one of our good friends who was walking her dog, and she said, I read the book last night with my daughter. And I wanted the book to be a simple read. I wanted the book to be a good read and a quick read. So it's got it all there. Um, some of the solutions and problems that are talked about in the book, some of the problems, one I have is to fix Congress. Of the three branches of government, it's our most poorly performing branch. It typically gets uh, approval ratings of 12 or 13 percent. As a country, we have a $19 trillion deficit. The Congress is responsible for our pocketbook. That means that all of us here today owe $58,000 to take care of the government's debt. Our Congress is so dysfunctional that between 2009 and 2013, four years, it took them four years to pass an annual budget. This is our government. This is a democracy. It's of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the people that we elect couldn't pass an annual budget for four years. I talk about creating a high-performance government. Many people in this room try and create high-performance businesses, high-performance nonprofits. I talk about a high-performance government. The USA Today, three years ago or so, wrote an article about our government the government that you and I own. And they said, when you take a look at the Small Business Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and 12 other government agencies, your chances of dying on the job are higher than getting fired on the job. I talk about fixing Social Security. This is an amazing program that President Roosevelt put in place 80 years ago. It's done so much for so many people, and it hangs by a financial thread, and it has been for decades. And no one has addressed the problem. I talk about defense spending. Uh, the chairman, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Mullen, was asked what America's greatest security threat was. And his simple answer was our national debt. If you take a look at America, we're 4% of the world's population, yet we spend 42% of the military dollars. America spends more money on defense than the next seven nations combined. I talk about our tax code. We today have a tax code that is 74,000 pages long. Since 2001, there have been 4,680 changes to the tax code. That means that we average one change per day for our tax code. I talk about reducing the risk of nuclear war. And a lot of people think that risk went away with the end of the Cold War. But I hate to tell you that accidents do happen. And just two examples, in uh, 1961, there was a B-52 flying over Goldsboro, North Carolina that broke up. It had two hydrogen bombs on board. Luckily, they didn't detonate. In 1995, Russian air defense mistook a meteorological rocket as a US nuclear missile launched from a submarine. The nuclear codes were opened up in front of Boris Yeltsin. He decided not to hit the button. I talk in the book about reducing gun violence in America. We have over 12,000 Americans who die every year from gun violence. A number that really isn't talked about is we have 75,000 Americans that are maimed every year by gun violence. 
It costs this country over $220 billion a year to take care of these people. Just think about the people who get paralyzed, the people who are shot, the lives that are shattered because of gun violence. If you take a look at America and you say there's 100,000 people, we line up 100,000 people, 30 of those people will die this year because of gun violence. If we line up 100,000 people in Canada, that number will be 0.51. You're 60 times more likely to be shot in the United States than you are in Canada. If you go to Germany, that number is 0.19, which means you're 150 times more likely to be shot in the United States than you are in Germany. It's all covered in the book. And if you take a look at healthcare in this country, we spend 17% of our GDP on healthcare, which is an amazing figure. I think the next closest country is 11%. We spend an amazing amount. We get the worst results. Our health in the United States is ranked 48th of developed countries. And worse yet, we're raising, as you eat your chocolate chip cookie, we are raising the most unhealthy generation in the history of this country. We're like a sports team that has the absolute highest payroll every year, and we get last place every single year. And nobody does anything about it. So I think it sounds horrible. And it is. And a point I'd like to make is this is a democracy. So it's not the people in Washington's mess. It's actually our mess. We're in charge of the government. So Tom Brokaw wrote a book years back. And his book was called The Greatest Generation. And it argued that the generation of men and women that fought in World War II and supported the effort at the home front was indeed the greatest generation. He argued that these men and women fought not for fame and recognition, but they fought because it was the right thing to do. And the bad news is that our generation does not have a lot to be proud of when it comes to the shape of this generation. The good news, and I know you've been waiting for that, is that all of these problems are solvable. And all of these problems present an amazing opportunity for people in this generation to stand up, to be heard, and to demand significant changes that truly would change the direction of this nation. So I think a key to the democracy is ed educating the citizenry. And I encourage all of you to get a copy of the book, pass it along to your family and friends, not because I need to sell books, I don't, but I would love to see a greater future for this country, and I think it really starts with people who know what our problems are, and most importantly, in this book, I outline really simple solutions for each one of these problems. So thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to our discussion. Oh, thanks, John. Um, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, it, it is a quick read. It's well worth taking a look at. I think it's provocative. I think you meant it to be provocative. Uh, let me ask you before we get in the weeds a little bit, a, kind of a top line question. Sometimes as I read your solutions, you, you sort of sound like a conservative. Sometimes you sound more liberal in your, your political point of view. You describe yourself as an independent. What's it mean in your mind to be an independent in this political environment? Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. I think to be an independent, in my view, is just stepping back, taking a look at the facts, and making a decision on your own. I think one of the problems we have in this country is we follow a political party, and we just follow that political party over the cliff, no matter what they stand for. And I think there's a lot of really smart people in this country, and when you take a look at the facts, and you make a decision as to what you think is in the best interest, you would get much different outcomes. Well, let's start with the tax code. And you mentioned in your introductory remarks 
Uh, it's something like 75,000 pages long, and even the instructions for the 1040A simple form is what, I don't know, 100 pages or whatever. Yep. It's, it's very complicated. What would you propose to do first to begin to solve that? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of things. One is it is 70, 75,000 pages long, and there's only 15% of Americans who take the deductions. Um, people in Congress are in charge of the tax code. And if you take a look at all the money that's involved in government today, all the money is driving all the regulations in the tax code because everybody's out there lobbying for different tax breaks. And the first thing I would do is I would fix Congress, and the second thing is I would have campaign finance reform. Is there's so much money floating around that these interest groups are getting stuff into the tax code. If you take a look at the military industrial complex over the past 15 years, the military industrial complex has spent $1.25 billion lobbying Washington. If you take a look at the healthcare industrial complex, the healthcare industrial complex has spent over $5 billion lobbying your representatives to get them to vote the way they want them to vote. And that's how you get that tax code, is you get all of these lobbyists who are putting all this stuff in to give treats to the people who gave them money to run these campaigns. So, so let's go to the... Could you use the mic better? Oh, sure. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Uh, so let, let's go to your proposals for Congress and for campaign finance reform. Uh, you're in favor of term limits, but you're also in favor of changing the term. Explain why you think that would make a difference. Well, I, I think if you take a look, Einstein once described, um, he, he once said that uh, insanity is if you continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. And I think what we do is we continue to do the same thing and we expect a different result. And what I do in Congress is I change the terms. Right now, a congressperson gets two years. So they only serve two years, and the day they get elected, they start raising money for the next campaign. They just, they constantly raise money. I'd switch those terms from two years to four years. I'd take the Senate from six years to four years, and I'd give everybody two terms. You get two terms. I'd also take a lesson from the founding fathers, and I'd say, this is public service. If you're worth more than $2 million, we're not going to pay you. We'll pay your expenses, but we're not going to pay you. I'd also say pensions for people in Congress, you don't need pensions. We're here for public service. If you made those changes, you would not get less qualified individuals. You would get more. There are amazing people in this room who would be awesome Congress people and senators. We would, we'd be fine. But if you really want to change the performance of the government, you've got to change the equation. Now, now some might say that, uh, would push back on that and say that, well, that means that people like Paul Ryan, for example, who's been in Congress for a number of years, and has developed seniority and risen through the ranks, that you would eliminate that, that uh, aspect of experience. It, what would you, how would you react to that criticism? You know, you know I would say um, it's not working. You know, we've, we've got a governmental body. People like their own congressman and they hate everybody else. And what they need to understand is it's the whole system. And what I would say to Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan's a competent guy, but he's got other things to do in his life. You know, he could serve two four-year terms if he wanted to run for president, he could run for president. There are other ways he could serve his country. Let's return to the tax issue for a minute. You have a couple specific ideas or things that you would do to make the tax system more effective and simpler. Can you talk about what those are? Well, to me, the, the biggest thing I, you know, one, th one of the great business people of the last 25 years is Steve Jobs. And I think as time goes on, he will loom even larger as, as an amazing business person. And when he came back to Apple for his second stint, he got everybody in a room and they put out 125 products. He wanted every product that, was, that they produced in that room. And they put them all in there, and at the end of the meeting, they were down to 10 products. And he said, everything we do at Apple is gonna be simple. And if you take a look at how he turned that company around, 
it was all about simplicity. And when I get to the tax code, I would say, we're gonna take the tax code and we're gonna reduce, it's gotta be 10 pages or less. I want everybody in this room to be able to understand the tax code. If you're an American taxpayer, you should understand the game that you're playing. That's the first thing I would do. Along with that, I'd take the brackets and I'd cut down the number of brackets. You don't need eight different brackets. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. If you get rid, I, I personally don't think that the government should be subsidizing, giving tax breaks to any business. I just get them all out. And, and what I do is, if it's in the strategic interest of the United States to give a business a tax break, then put it in that department's budget. So everybody can see tax break for Exxon Oil, $2.8 billion. And you know exactly what it is. It's not hidden in the tax code so that nobody ever sees it. That's you, what I do. You, you favor lowering the rate, though, for business, too, don't you, in I, addition to reducing them? I would lower the rate for business just because you can do it because so many businesses take incredible exemptions. If you take a look, 2011, General Electric, great American company. I mean, really well run, great American company. General Electric makes a profit of $14 billion. They file a tax return that is 56,000 pages. Does anybody want to guess how much they paid in taxes that year? Zero. That's our government. That's my point in this whole thing. It's of the people, by the people, and for the people, and we have people in Congress who tolerate this. It's crazy. So let's move to Social Security. You brought it up uh, in the introduction. Uh, what sorts of things do you think you would like to see happen to make Social Security solvent long term? So one of the things I believe in, um, and this is an old family thing, is uh, to whom, whom much is given, much is required. And I think there are a lot of people and a lot of people in this room who have who've had a great life here in an amazing country. And there are people who have problems who need help. And what Social Security does is Social Security not only takes care of the elderly, and it's a big chunk, it's like 60% of people's income who are over 65. Social Security takes care of the elderly, Social Security takes care of the disadvantaged, Social Security provides insurance for people who work. This has really been a great American program. And some people get on this thing who hate taxes and they hate the government, the reality is it's not that simple, and Social Security actually has done what it was set out to do. The problem with Social Security is it's going broke. Because if you ever say at any time in Washington that we need to raise taxes, then you're dead. And I take a look at Social Security, and you pay 6% of your income to Social Security up to $116,000. After $116,000, you pay zero. So if you have somebody who's making $50,000 a year and they pay 6%, they're paying $3,000. If you have somebody who makes $10 million a year, they're paying, you know, they're paying the max. They're paying $7,200. They pay twice as much and they're making, I don't know, 100 times more. And this is a simple solution and it was brought up in Simpson Bowles, scrap the cap. And I think that is a program, Social Security. There's a lot of people who need help, and it's a compassionate thing that people in this country can do. The last thing I'd do is there was a really great program on 60 Minutes about fraud in Social Security disability. Is once you get on Social Security disability, they never take you off. And I would re-examine every one of those cases every three years. You have situations, there's a law firm, and I think it's, I won't say the state, but there's a law firm that collected $75 million in one year from Social Security for getting people onto disability. I'm not making this stuff up. So I, I wanna move to the issue of gun violence. It's something you spend a fair amount of time talking about in the book. Um, 
And when I said you've, you're provocative in some cases, um, w one thing I meant by that is that some of the ideas you throw out there, like reforming the tax code or things that I could see happening, yeah. even in this Congress, a couple of things you propose on the gun violence scene, rewriting the Second Amendment, for one, I can't see this Congress doing, at least at this point. So talk about the, what your thinking is behind that and what some of your other ideas are regarding gun violence. I'm, I'm a data guy. So if we just took everybody and we said, okay, here's a problem, and the problem is that 12,000 people are killed a year. We've got 75,000 people who are maimed a year, shot a year in this country, the United States of America. And it's costing us $225 billion. I would think we'd need to do something. And so what I propose is, you ch there's a great book, if you ever get the chance, there's a book by Justice Stevens on five changes he'd make to the Constitution, and one of them is the Second Amendment. And he just add five words onto the Second Amendment, but it clarifies the Second Amendment. And that's one of the things I would do. The second thing I'd do is I'd get rid of assault rifles. I mean, how this country can say that you can go out and buy an assault rifle that spits out 30 bullets in 30 seconds, and you can go to a nightclub in Orlando and find 50 people dead, or you can go to an elementary school in Connecticut and find 20 people dead. What, what do you need to do for this, for people to say, stop? And I just take a look at it and go, we need to do something about this. And when I wrote the book and I passed it out for people to look at the draft, people came back and said, don't put the gun thing in there. <laughs> I go, I'm not running for political office. I'm going to put in there what I want to put in there. <laughs> and, and so I take, on, I take on a lot of things in the book because I think we need to talk about things. And if you take a look at, at the current election, right, you tell me what either one of the candidates' position is on changing Social Security. Or you tell me what either one of the candidates' position is on defense spending. Or what is somebody going to do, what are either one of the candidates going to do to fix Congress? Or what's your, what, what's your, how are you going to, we have a transportation in this country that's rated a D plus. You cannot have over the medium term a viable economy, a global leader with a D plus. And we have everybody who agrees the transportation system's in terrible state and there's nobody who's standing up and saying, this is how I'll pay for it. And so when I take on issues like the gun violence issue, I, I take them all on. And I just think we need to relook at things here in this country. So let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you're not a big fan. Uh, what kinds of things would you like to see happen with health care? And talk about the Trek experience yeah. that you discuss in the book. Okay. I, I think this is huge. And we had a situation at Trek 10 years ago where in two, a matter of two weeks, this is what happened. We had a truck driver who was overweight have a heart attack driving the truck across Iowa, and that was it for him. He survived, but he could never work again. We had a really nice woman in our international department who had lost a bunch of weight. Her husband was way overweight, and at 48, he had a stroke. He was a vegetable, he still is, totally ruined the family. And then the third incident was we had this big guy in the warehouse, big guy. And I used to play football against him in the old guys versus the young bucks game. And this guy was huge. And uh, Craig Umblin, he was a manager in the warehouse and somebody came into my office and said, uh, Craig Umblin died last night. And the death certificate came to my desk and the cause of death was obesity. And so I got the HR guy into my office and I said, you know what, we need to do something here. And we talked a little bit and uh, I said, let's get everybody together tomorrow. And so I got everybody together in the atrium and I had three slides that day and the only slides were three pictures. And I told those three stories and I said, we're gonna make a change to the healthcare plan here at Trek. We have a health risk assessment program. We're gonna make it mandatory that everybody takes a health risk assessment. If your score is not at a certain level, we're gonna help you. We're gonna give you coaching. 
we're going to give you programs, we're going to do a whole bunch of things, but if you don't care about your health, we're not going to pay for it. I said, the bike company is doing fine, but I care about your health, and if you don't, we're not going to pay for it. And then the lawyer came in and he said, well, you can't do that. And I said, I said, okay. Also so note, he right. says we need fewer lawyers. Right, in this exactly. <laughs> and so I said, okay, so we figured out a way that we could make people that they were going to actually have to pay more. But we've had amazing success at Trek. I go to a 20-year club dinner. It's the number one comment I get every year. Thanks for the health program. Smoking average in America, it's like 19.2%. When we started our program at Trek, it was 18.2%. Today, smoking at Trek is less than 2%. You can make a big difference. You know, one of the things, I was actually, I was actually at the Reagan Library on Friday at the Burke family vacation, and, and on the desk, on his replica desk in the Oval Office, there's something that says it can be done. All these problems, they all can be dealt with. And that's really the good news here. Uh, so, John, one last question for me before we open it up to the, uh, uh, the audience here. Uh, a lot of times, people uh, who are interested in politics write a book before they decide to run for office. So, are you running for an office anytime soon? Yeah, the answer to that is no. I uh, work out at the bike company, and a lot of people write a book. A lot of people decide to run for office, and then they write a book. I decided to write this book on the drive home when I heard David McCullough, and I've spent five years uh, pecking away at this thing. I'm a little slow because of my day job, and uh, I finally got it done. All right, let's open it up. Uh, questions for John? Yes, sir, and I'll repeat the question. And the question is, uh, you talk about term limits, but what about the bureaucracy, which is sizable? Okay, I did not pay you to ask that question. True? <laughs> okay, so one of my ideas in the book, which I think is actually a great idea, is that the current uh, House of Representatives has 435 people. I think it's impossible to have a high-performing Congress with 435 people, so one of my uh, proposals is that you cut the Congress from 435 down to 221. And I think you can cut the size of Congress. I think you'll get uh, better relationships with fewer people. You'll get better compromise. You'll get more work done. You'll have less cost because you're not only getting rid of 200 Congress people, you're getting rid of 200 offices. I would definitely reduce the size. And that's where I'd start. More questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the five words that Justice Stevens would add to the Second Amendment. Um, it's in the book. It's something right at the end. It's something about your right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed if you're in the military. And, and one of the things you really have to look at, and one of the things I thought when I read the Second Amendment was, there, there's a, on one of the candidates who's running for office, if you look, and, and it's really disheartening if you ever want to spend some time, go look at the candidates' plans for this country. These people are running for the highest office in the land. They're basically being interviewed by the American people, and they're basically saying close to nothing. And if you go and look at one of the websites of somebody who's running, they put down the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, period. And that's in parentheses. Let's <laughs> go. So, that's not what... That's not what it says. What it says is a well-regulated militia, comma. And we keep twisting these things and people run 30-second ads. And you really got to take a look at what it actually says. Yeah, Dan. What are your thoughts on the redistricting process? Uh, his thoughts <laughs> on the redistricting process. Okay, well, I think... Um, I think that redistricting is terrible, and I think it's basically fixing elections. And I offer two examples in my book, and I show the maps of where the district started and then where the district ends. And to me, it's fixing an election, and it's 
not democratic. It's, it should be one vote for one person, and by gerrymandering, you're taking the right of the vote away from the people. And the people who are doing that are people in Congress. It's crazy. Yes, sir, way over here. So part of that question is, what can the average person do? And that goes right to the epilogue of your book. Um, I'll let you start with that. You know, I think the number one thing that somebody can do is educate yourself on what the real issues are in this country. And as I researched the book, I became aware that I wasn't really as well educated as I thought about the predicament that we're in as a nation. So number one, I think you can educate yourself. The second thing I think you can do is educate your family and your friends. I had somebody who read the book and went out and bought 10 copies because he wanted to hand them out to his friends. That's the first thing. The second thing I think you can do is you can definitely increase um, the dialogue in this country in a very civil way. And I always ask people, one thing I try and do when I'm in a business situation is that I try and put myself in the other person's shoes so I can see how they look at the situation. And I think if more people put themselves in other people's shoes and looked at the whole problem instead of looking at it just from their vantage point, we'd be a lot better off. Other questions? Yes, sir, back there. Uh, on the immigration question, where that's do you stand? A, that's number 13. <laughs> Can I tell a funny story? <laughs> sure. Uh, we, have, we have a bunch of businesses around the world and we have a business in uh, Mexico. And so I was doing a business review and our business leader was on the phone from uh, Trek, Mexico and uh, just as a kind of a funny comment at the end, I said to Luis, I said, Luis, are you ready for the wall? And Luis said, he said, J.B., he goes, you don't understand, we are very good tunnel diggers. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> What's your view on trade deals, treaties, and open markets? Well, we, we run a global business and about 60% of Trek's business is outside the United States. I think you've got to get into the details because you see some stuff. Um, I remember going to Japan in the 90s when the car industry wasn't doing well and everybody was blaming it on the Japanese and you can't do business in Japan. Trek's most successful and most profitable business over the past 25 years has been in Japan. Um, so I think you really got to get into the detail. You take a look at some of the countries we're competing in and the duties are 40% and yet those countries can send bicycles into the United States at 10%. If you take a look at some other countries, they can send bikes in the United States at less than that. I just know about the bike business, but man, those trade deals are super complicated and you, you have to get into the details. All I know is, is that global trade is overall it is good. If you take a look at companies like Trek, if you take a look at Harley Davidson, if you take a look at GE Medical, a ton of that product is going outside of the United States. If you go out to Waterloo, a bunch of people that are employed out in Waterloo, they're employed because of global trade. And I think overall, you gotta be confident in yourself as a country, confident in yourself as a business that you wanna perform on the global stage. Right here. So your view on uh, direct legislation from the people at the federal level? So I don't, ha I don't know enough about that to comment on it. It's a really good question. Sorry. Yes, sir. So without Walter Cronkite uh, <laughs> in a fragmented media environment, how, how do people get educated where there seems to be various sets of facts? I think, that's, I think that's a really good point. And I think what you see in a lot of these elections is you see candidates running 30 second ads that are really on the fringe of the truth. And then you see media outlets lined up behind candidates who back that up. And I think one of the things that I've found is, is data, you can't, it's, it's much harder to lie with data. So if I said to you that there are 12,000 people that are killed every year in the United States with guns, that's a fact. If I said to you 
that we have a $19 trillion deficit. That's a fact. One of the things I tried to do writing this book is address your question. And I really went through that book with a fine tooth comb to say the only things in here are real facts. And I left it at that. But I was able to do a bunch of research and you can kind of sift out the far left, the far right, and then kind of what's there and, and you can find it. Other questions? Sir, in the back. Uh, where does he stand on executive orders from the uh, president? You know, I don't, have, um, I don't have anything in the book on that. I will say that if you went through and reformed Congress, and one of the things I go through in the book is here are five simple core values that I think the government should have, and one of them is simplicity. And if you take a look at how complicated and how legalistic we are as a society, if we could simplify things, I think you would get a lot fewer executive orders. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, getting back to the immigration, you know, we Absolutely. I think it's crazy. You know, and there's examples of like the guy from Alibaba. It's one of the biggest companies in the world right now, and he went to school in New York, and he tried to stay in the United States, and he couldn't, and he left, and he went to China created one of the biggest businesses in the world. You've got all these tech companies that are in America who have, you know, Microsoft, Apple. You take a look at these great people who want to live in the United States. That's how we built this country. We built it on immigration. And you've got people who are blocking immigration reform. That's the one part about immigration I understand. And to me, that's absolutely crazy. You have built this country on immigrants and you have highly qualified immigrants who want to come to the United States. And so the Statue of Liberty is sitting up there with a torch saying, no. We're the country that, aren't we famous for taking walls down? You know, people look up to us as a nation, they talk about us all over the world. We're, we're the guys who take walls down. All right, I think we have to leave it there. Thanks so much. Let's thank John Burke. Thank you.